Today I'm going to talk about the role of OCS prep in the Marine Corps. We'll take a look at the AK-47. We'll talk food for thought, and I'll introduce decision-making exercises. I'm Simon the Zealot, and you're watching Beyond the Crossroads. Let's kick it. Real quick, I know that we started a series on personal finance in the last episode. I promised to pick that back up next week, and there's plenty more to come on that, so stand by. In the meantime, we're going to look at a really interesting and important question presented by one of my viewers. He writes, As I'm approaching the old side, OCS 25 years ago, I wonder if there's any room in the core for raw talent slash ability anymore without getting all the inside scoop before taking on the challenge. I know it's tough enough, even with awareness of all the tips and tricks, but something about it just seems a bit off in a way that I can't quite put my finger on. Something about what was once called the fog of war, the stress of uncertainty, or some such thing. To summarize, are we causing people who would otherwise fail to succeed by giving them the inside track on OCS? Now, this is a good question and one that I pondered for some time before beginning this channel. Uh, this question also brings up a more complicated question, which is what defines a good or ideal Marine? Now, while the viewer comment was addressing events that happen only at OCS, I in my reply will address OCS prep and really Marine Corps prep as a category. And also try to give some meaningful insight on the more complicated question as well. Now, there are entire commands devoted to the more complicated question of what is a good or ideal Marine. Uh, but that still is a question that every Marine, and especially every officer, should consider. With all that said, let's get started. So, my first thought, and I'm speaking for myself here, is that the purpose of my OCS prep videos is to raise the average of the candidates going into OCS. If you look at the population chart from my expectations video, the Marine Corps should want its officer corps entirely in this section. Put another way, the Marine Corps wants nines and tens, which is fairly obvious. If I, through OCS prep content, can turn fours into fives and fives into sixes, that leaves less ground for the Marine Corps to cover to get the best possible officer court can. OCS comes with the risk and even the danger that candidates won't retain as much knowledge as they should. If candidates don't retain what they learn in class, they will conduct themselves in one of two ways as they continue their careers. Either they will guess at what's right, or they're going to take the time to get it right, and guessing is often the more expedient option. Now, you hope that somebody corrects them at some point, but there's no guarantee that that happens. And uh, the danger is that if a person is guessing at what's right, he will be wrong some part of the time, and in being wrong, will promulgate bad habits. If, on the other hand, candidates can take in information when they're fresh and eager, like through OCS prep content, this is good for the Marine Corps because they will carry that knowledge into OCS and the rest of their career. It is therefore my conviction that it is better for candidates to get the basics right before they're on payroll and while they're under the pressure of performing well at OCS. Beside that, OCS prep on the internet is just applying new technology to an old idea. OSOs are already preparing their candidates for OCS, not only with knowledge, but with the leadership exercises and military skills as well. Online content is the same idea and should be seen as an aid. OSOs can rely on this content to cover the entry-level material so that they can focus on higher-level preparation. And higher-level preparation means better candidates, which means better officers, which means a better Marine Corps. Finally, information about OCS can be gleaned from various other sources. Take this PBS documentary, for example. Mm -hmm. 
the Leadership Reaction course has become one of our most well-known leadership models. Candidate Armendez. Way to copy. It's a series of stalls that are set up with seemingly impossible obstacles. This morning, the enemy attempted to destroy the bridge with explosives. A portion of the bridge structure stands in the river. You can see your squad leader and the stretcher. They'll be giving a tactical mission to move something that makes sense. The fire team must deliver the container of supplies to the resistance group. Moving ammo across a blown bridge, and the only thing that'll be present will be the stakes of the bridge. You found three planks that appear strong enough to support your weight. All red areas are rigged with explosives. We're taking all these elements, the stress and the chaos, and then we're throwing them in there with uh, with four of their peers that they have to actually lead. Okay, we have to deliver the supplies and get them to the other side. All we want to see is, can the candidate lead his peers? Red is dead, we know that. Does anybody have any suggestions right now? We can use the pulse. We got that line we can lash it with, or we can use pulse. Can he go out there and with some stress, some chaos, some friction thrown at him, you know, what is he made of? Is there something in there that will make him lead? And, and ultimately, that's what we're looking for, is that leadership potential inside him. Whether he completes the course or not is not really the evaluation. I'm going to tie this, and I'm going to throw you the rope, and you'll be able to pull it right up. It's the conduct, okay, it, the way that he motivates his team, okay. the way he gets the team moving. That's now lineups used as a fulcrum to get to slide this to the other side, these pipes. If we could get the pipes magically over, yeah. For instance, if he drops something and he no longer has it. Oh. Does he wait or does he adjust the plan? It's a very good way in about 10 minutes to get an assessment of fog friction and can they make a decision on an area they're totally unfamiliar with. Track with me, try it. Okay, okay, do, 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 do it, do it, do it. That's it. Our time's up. Time is done. When your initial plan didn't work, you froze. You stopped. You get people kicked. Yes, that's right. All right. There'll be an evaluation sheet for the evaluator, and he will rank him across all of these leadership traits and come up with a final score. And of course, this goes into his leadership evaluation. All right, Seth, sorry. Watch your team member, brought him back up, kept on moving. That's the one thing I see good that you did do. All right, Seth, sorry. And did, did show that you was a team player, right? My second thought is that anyone who has ever executed a plan knows the vast disparity between imagining it, writing it down, and carrying it out. People typically think that the plan they've come up with is God's gift to the human race because it just looks so great on paper. But anyone who has ever tried to carry a plan out knows that they're playing an entirely different ballgame. At OCS, there's the rush of adrenaline once the clock has started in your LRC or once you start taking fire during the Suli that no amount of OCS videos can prepare you for. The ability to test someone's reaction to stress in the fog of war is not lost by giving them an idea of what they will be facing. There's no way to pregame reacting to something you haven't done before, especially under the sleep deprivation, calorie restriction, and general chaos of OCS. Third thought, OCS prep material is easily accessible to anyone considering the Marine Corps as a career path. Let's just say searching it out, finding it, and using it is an opportunity for some leaders' recon. The candidates who don't take advantage of it are exposing themselves to the risk of being left behind, and their enthusiasm and initiative might be considered suspect. Also, it would never be advisable for an officer to head into any situation relying entirely on his ability to figure it out. Yes, we want officers to be on the fly critical thinkers, and the more of them that we can have that can do that, the better. But if we can supplement that skill with information that can enhance a decision, that would be preferable. Consider this formula, gut, data, gut. We rely on our gut to make decisions, but we augment our gut with training and we set it up for success by providing it intel. In doing so, we make it a stronger gut. My fourth thought is that OCS prep content is one of the ways in which the Marine Corps can and should grow. To illustrate, if the bar is raised for a pole vaulter, the vaulter must practice vaulting higher. If an enemy brings some new technology to the battlefield, his adversary must evolve to counteract it. 
if the level of training at OCS no longer shakes candidates in the way that the Marine Corps wants them to be shaken, then the Corps must change the challenges that it presents to candidates. Fifth thought is that I'm doubtful as to how much you can extrapolate a candidate's time at OCS to the quality of their career as an officer, even in the field. There are two points I want to make here. First, in my experience, the majority of candidates get dropped because of injury, integrity, or what I will call lifestyle dissonance. That's either drop on request or failure to adapt. OCS prep content doesn't address any of these three areas in any way that could be considered unfair. For example, you can watch all of the videos on OCSPT you want, but if you're not taking care of yourself physically, you're going to perform poorly and or get injured and get dropped as a result. The second point is something that I've mentioned before, which is that competence is largely the result of practice and determination. This applies to book knowledge, but also applies to other abilities like intuition and decision making. As an example, let's take a look at a famous General Mattis quote. He once said, I spent 30 years to get ready for that decision that took 30 seconds. Second Lieutenant Mattis would not be as prepared to make that decision as General Mattis. 30 years worth of studying, thinking, applying, and reflecting went into the ability to make that critical decision in 30 seconds. Now, that's not to say that everyone starts or can end at the same level of a given skill. Certainly, there is such a thing as a natural talent or propensity. But unless you're suggesting that OCS graduates only future commandants, you have to allow time for the fours and fives to become sevens and eights. That takes more than the 10 weeks of OCS to do. Now, obviously we want to minimize the amount of fours and fives graduating, but to screen them all out with the resources available is basically impossible. And to say that their dead weight to the Marine Corps is, in my view, unnecessarily pessimistic. People can and will grow with the right pressure. To summarize, I'll quote from the Canon Regulations. By study, instruction, and practice, a reasonably intelligent person can become an effective leader. The sixth and final thought is that there will only be one Commandant. The Marine Corps requires a wide variety of proficiencies outside of combat arms. Now, while I believe that every Marine officer should be a student of warfare, we don't have the luxury to discard talent in the supporting skills, especially if those skills can serve as force multipliers. Now, I'm not saying that we should change anything about the selection process. What I'm saying is that victory demands much more than raw talent in one slice out of the entire range of operations. While we obviously shouldn't turn down raw talent, we should very seriously consider the merits of what I'll call trained talent. And that's for two reasons. First, raw talent is invariably in short supply. And second, when raw talent is developed, it generally rises to the top. So for these two reasons, an organization must rely on trained talent to build the rest of the structure. We can break down any professional population into three basic groups. And here I'll use the FitRep Christmas tree as a visual aid. Our first group is our developed talent. It's made up of people with natural ability or raw talent for a particular skill that is then refined and enhanced by training. Our second group is our trained talent. This group is made up of people with no clear-cut affinity or propensity for a particular skill, but who can nonetheless be trained to proficiency and even mastery. And our third group is non-trained, non-talent. This group is made up of people who don't have a particular ability for a skill and training hasn't done them any good. Now, it's never as simple or as clear-cut as I've just described it. Because people are complicated, whatever skills they have are obfuscated by a whole host of variables, including circumstances, personal motivation, attitude, etc. 
the bottom line in this entire discussion is that Marines make do. We try to get the best assets we possibly can, and we do the best that we can do with the assets we've got. This doesn't change with our human assets. And a broader view of human assets might even uncover opportunities that we had previously missed. So I hope that gives you all some insight into why I believe that OCS prep and candidate and officer development content is good for the Marine Corps. To say that our future depends on it, at least in part, is not unreasonable. Make up your mind. I'm introducing this segment as a mainstay on the program. I'm going to start with simple moral decision-making scenarios and later incorporate more tactical and strategic scenarios. So this week's scenario is as follows. You were the head basketball coach at Central High School. For the first time in many, many years, the varsity basketball team has made it to the state finals. If you win finals, a donor will give a large sum of money to the entire athletics program keeping several teams active for years to come that would have been canceled otherwise. In the last week of practice, you tell your team that not one rule can be broken or they will be suspended for the rest of the season. Everyone must be at practice each night at the scheduled time, no exceptions. Brad and Mike are two of the team starters. From their perspective, they're indispensable to the team. With them playing, Central will probably win. Without them playing, Central will probably lose the game and, as a result, the donor. Brad and Mike show up one hour late to Monday's practice. You are obviously furious because they have deliberately disobeyed your orders, but you understand the critical role they play. If you enforce the rule, Brad and Mike won't play in the finals but the future of the entire athletics program depends on them playing. And athletics is one of the few stabilizing forces for many of the kids at Central. So do you play them or not? If you have an answer, leave it in the comment section. Give me something to shoot. This week's weapon is the AK, short for Avtomat Kalashnikova. Avtomat being the Russian word for assault rifle. The AK has been the most widely produced and distributed firearm in the world. AKs are known for their durability and were exported en masse and the designs were licensed liberally by the Soviet Union. The original AK-47 was developed by Mikhail Kalashnikov, who was a tanker in World War II. He was wounded in 1941 and during his recovery heard much from his hospital mates of the problems with the issued Soviet firearms and the superior firearms of the Germans. He resolved then to make a more serviceable weapon for his fellow soldiers. For the next few years, Kalashnikov created and pitched various assault rifle prototypes to the Soviet military. Though his early models were initially rejected, his ability to design weapons provided further opportunities to present his prototypes to officials. In 1945, Kalashnikov began working on the model that would become the AK-47. It was tested in 1946 and in 1947 was given its official designation as the AK-47. It was introduced into service in 1949. The original AK-47 was chambered for a 7.62 by 39 millimeter cartridge, simply known as 7.62. It was slightly shorter, slightly heavier, and effective to shorter ranges than the M16. The AK-47 was retooled and reintroduced as the AKM in 1959, the M standing for modernized. Like the M16, the AK saw its first major action in the Vietnam War. Since the AKM, the AK family tree has grown far and wide. The AK-74 was the next major iteration and was designed to fire the smaller 5.45 by 39 millimeter cartridge and included other improvements. The AKS-74 featured a folding stock, and the AKS-74U was the carbine version. The S standing for the Russian word for folding, and the U standing for the Russian word for shortened. The AKS-74M was the next iteration, and it replaced all wooden parts with a black polymer and included a mounting rail, among other improvements. The AK-100 series, designed and first produced in the 1990s, was the next generation of Kalashnikovs. 
The AK-101 and the AK-102 carbine were chambered for the NATO 5.56 cartridge. The AK-103 and the AK-104 carbine were chambered for 7.62. The AK-105 carbine, like the AK-74, was chambered for 5.45 and served as the successor to the AKS-74U in the Russian military. Finally, the AK-107 and the AK-108 incorporated a balanced recoil system and were chambered for 5.45 and 5.56 respectively. The 100 series has since been revamped as designated by an M at the end of the model number. The newest AKs are the AK-12, which is chambered for 5.45, and the AK-15, chambered for 7.62. They each have a carbine version as denoted by a K after the model number. Russian AKs have been by and large produced by the Izhevsk Machine Building Plant, or Izhmash for short. In 2013, Izhmash became the Kalashnikov Concern, which continues to produce modern AKs. AK-style rifles have otherwise been produced by arms manufacturers in over a dozen countries. They are estimated to be more than 100 million Russian-made AKs or foreign-made AK-style weapons in the world today. Something on your mind? This week's food for thought is from Proverbs 19.11. It states, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Good sense is the maturity of mind to know which things to commit energy to and which to forget about. It is a critical skill for everyone, but especially for officers and officers in training. There will be plenty of offense that you will encounter in your career, starting with the training pipeline and ending probably never. Controlling your emotions and reactions will allow you to solve problems quicker. You'll be a better example to the people around you, and you will avoid burning bridges. So that's it for today's show. If you have any questions, comments, requests, or suggestions, let me know. And as always, remember, it is not about you. Stay hungry, stay humble, stay out of trouble. Happy New Year, big things to come in 2018. Stay tuned and take care. I'm about to drop the hammer and dispense some indiscriminate justice.